What's up tomorrow? Today, Athena, what is on your mind? We have dwarf mergers that are feeding stellar formation, and I love stars. Oh, and I love feeding. Mm. Oh, and Mike, what about you? What are you excited about today? Oh, oh man, I'm really excited about NASA investing in some of my favorite space projects, and it's going to be awesome oh. because these things are really going to happen. Ooh, oh, that makes me so, so excited. excited. And Jared on the observation deck, what do we have out there? Well, we've got Chuck Ryan on to talk a little bit about the space shuttle you've never heard of. That sounds exciting because I haven't heard of it. So today, tomorrow starts right now. <laughs> Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Greetings, friends of tomorrow. My name is Jade, and I will be your host for today. We have Athena with some really exciting news, but before we launch into that, we are actually going to have us a few launch minutes from Mr. Mike himself. Mike, what do you got for us today? <laughs> oh, man. So first off, we have a launch of a Falcon 9 Block 5 rocket, and it was awesome. This launched from Launch Complex 40 in Cape Canaveral, Florida at 0518 Coordinated Universal Time on Tuesday, August 7th. Its payload was the Mariputa, uh, also known as the Telcom 4 communications satellite, headed to geosynchronous orbit. And this flight was really cool because it was the first flight, or rather the first reflight, of a Block 5 Falcon 9. And it just so happened to be the very first Block 5 Falcon 9 that was launched back in May, uh, May 11th, which flew the Bengabandhu 1 satellite. And this was uh, uh, just beautiful footage. I really love the color production on this one. And it happened to be the 15th space launch for the year. And something else that was really cool about this is they were able to land successfully on the drone ship, the of course I still love you drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and it was the 28th successful booster landing for SpaceX. Ah, and of course they delivered the satellite successfully. <laughs> yes, that's always important, of course. And you know what? You're right. You know, it just, even though we've already, you know, kind of done the whole launch it and land it back down on, of course, I love you, it just, it never gets old. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, by the way, amazing job. I know these launch minutes are relatively new, but you know what, Mike? You're killing it. But uh, we did kind of cheat a little bit. We were a little lucky. And why is that? I think there was initially supposed to be two launches you were going to cover today. Isn't that correct? There was, there was. There was a, a scrub uh, late last night of the Delta IV Heavy, which was carrying the Parker Solar Probe uh, to a solar orbit. And hopefully that will be launching um, within 24 hours. So late tonight or early tomorrow morning, depending on where you are in the world. Otherwise, if that 24-hour uh, turnaround doesn't work, then hopefully we'll have a new launch date target for that very soon. Uh, but something I did want to say about this particular launch is I have to say that Lauren Lyons is my favorite host of the SpaceX webcast, and I was so happy to see her get to host this one uh, itself. And just the footage on this one was just beautiful. It really was. It really was. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And you know what? Fingers yeah. crossed on the Parker Solar Probe. I know it's just waiting for its vacation. It's very sunny vacation. Um, so yeah. awesome job. Now, um, Athena. One other thing, too, uh, since we've been keeping track of it, uh, this was the 21st <laughs> launch uh, for the United States overall this year, uh, 21st oh. orbital launch for the United States. If wow. the Delta IV Heavy had taken off, we'd be at 22. But uh, we'll hopefully be able to report on that next week. Well, we look forward to it, and we expect it. So if it doesn't go through and doesn't work, then you know what? We're blaming you, Mike. Oh, <laughs> That's no. just how it is. That's what you signed up for on this show. Full responsibility. Like, no. Yes. <laughs> you better be nervous. I'm okay. Nervous. <laughs> All right, Athena. And it looks like we have some uh, star-making fuel, maybe? or Yes. So it's um, dwarf mergers, which gets me really, really exciting because I kind of <laughs> feel like dwarf galaxies are totally underappreciated. Um, so this gets me really excited because there's so much potential in um, dwarf galaxies alone because they contain a lot of hydrogen gas. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, they tend to, to get outshined literally by um, other galaxies <laughs> like the Milky Way galaxy because they're just so much more luminous, they're really bright. And dwarf galaxies are kind of hard to, to trace sometimes. Mm -hmm. But there was um, a, a few research papers I was actually reading recently about um, dwarf mergers that when uh, sometimes if you have a dwarf galaxy, if it actually gets pulled in by the gravitational pull of another galaxy that's much larger than it, it can cause it to whip it's uh, like a tail out into interstellar space that can stretch to about a billion light years in length. And Whoa. this literally can seed new star formation, which is super exciting because like for a lot of us out there, we wanna try and find life beyond Earth. We wanna find other planets and exoplanets are found around, well, other types of stars and other stars that are out there. So this gets me really excited. Um, this right here actually is a computer simulation. So. Um, the astrophysicist behind this study, her name is Sarah Pearson, and it's really cool because I recognize her name and she, I know her from Instagram, which is really cool. And she, this was her study she, that actually got her, oh, her PhD. Social media. <laughs> Literally, I was actually talking to her on my way over here. So this is a computer simulation of um, a dwarf galaxy merging um, with another galaxy that's much larger than it. And this was the first time that there was a computer simulation directly matched up with real observational data. Nice. So this is really, really exciting. Um, and it shows that a lot of times that from this uh, uh, hydrogen gas that's found in these uh, uh, dwarf galaxies, when they merge like this, it will start to form and it'll cause um, literally the, the necessary seeding elements for stars to form. So this is a very exciting study. Um, right now, we actually still don't even know really how galaxies gain a lot of their mass. So the more that we can understand about this, the more we'll understand just about what's happening elsewhere in the universe. The mm -hmm. fact that this actually ha is happening so you know, so near to us. And actually, the small Magellanic Cloud is um, what's actually uh, merging with, with uh, the Milky Way. We've actually stripped gas from the small Magellanic Cloud, and that's actually what's caused a lot of um, the stars that we know that have formed here. So again, I mean, stars, star formations, this is a gorgeous picture of um, actually a, a dwarf galaxy. And this is just, uh, it's up in the, the right hand corner. It's just a zoom in image, but I thought it was really pretty. So I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, not actually uh, specifically to, to this study, but I wanted to just show you guys an example of a, a dwarf galaxy because they're very, very dim. Um, mm -hmm. But again, they, they contain all the elements for, for new stars. So again, this is super exciting. I'm, I can't wait for more of this research to come out because Again, like I've, I've, with more stars forming, you know, more potential for, for planetary formations to happen, maybe around these stars and maybe other planets. And with, you know, tests and all the exciting stuff, like once James Webb launches, uh, seeking for, for planet exoplanetary yeah. systems in life. So um, anything that has to do with, with trying to find uh, other stuff. Other out little there critters out excited. there. Exactly. Totally. So this is, I'm super stoked. Yeah, and I love yeah. the fact that you mentioned that, you know, dwarf galaxies often, you know, they're n not necessarily overlooked, but they don't get as much attention because they're not yeah. as glamorous as, like, you know, like Andromeda or <laughs> the Milky Way. The Milky Way. Um, but there's still so <laughs> much to be learned, like you said. Yes. I mean, <clears throat> even when it comes to, you know, exploring exoplanets and then learning more about uh, galactic evolution, I mean, there's yeah. so much knowledge to be had. So, I mean, thank you for uh, highlighting the underdog. Not necessarily, yeah. not saying dwarfs are, uh, the dwarf galaxies are underdogs, but you know, for bringing light to this really <laughs> amazing research. Yeah. <laughs> He's getting real excited. But yeah, of dwarf galaxy, right? I mean, we have our own, it's the small Magellan Yeah, it's like our, it's like like our yeah. little, uh, yeah. I mean, not to be small demeaning to it, but I, I always imagined it like our little puppy, you know? It's like it's like our little puppy, <laughs> or like our little brother, you know? It's just like, hey, mm, you know? Yeah. And then like Andromeda's our big scary sister, like, uh, she's coming at me. But, yeah, uh, oh, and when that merging <laughs> happens, that's going to be insane. Gonna you know, Andromeda Milky Way, whoo! All right, Wish Mike. I could be alive. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Um, so you know what? I can just tell you're bursting at the seams with excitement because apparently NASA's going to be funding some uh, some of your favorite missions potentially. Yeah, and uh, a lot of these missions, you guys, um, well, uh, some of them we've been talking about on previous shows, and uh, some of the people watching might already be familiar with these, but they've invested some money for research and development for lunar landers, also for the commercialization of the International Space Station, and there's been some progress, too, from Sierra Nevada for one of their contracts already to provide habitats for the, the lunar orbiting platform gateway. So, oh, man, I'm really excited <laughs> about all of this stuff. Um, for, for the lunar landers, um, of course, they were invested a little bit of money into Blue Origin. Um, this is for their propulsion and the navigation radar for it. But they also gave some money to Astrobotic, who is going to be getting uh, a 
studies for the lander's engine as well as their navigation radar. So kind of the same contract as Blue Origin. Um, and United Launch Alliance also got uh, some uh, a contract as well, and this is for their ACES upper stage. Oh man, something that's really cool about this is it's going to fund the integrated vehicle fluids flight demonstration, which is a, a, the demo flight of the whole system that they have that would be able to reduce the boil off so that they don't lose fuel. And it's also a necessary technology that they need in order to do uh, transfers, fuel transfers and refueling in orbit so that they can eventually possibly have their own lunar lander one day. Um, we do have a couple of other images that uh, is from some of the other stuff. Uh, there is also some funding that they got for their mid-air retrieval demonstration of the Vulcan uh, engine. Um, and uh, there's also a bunch of uh, uh, contracts that were put out for the International Space Station. Um, Axiom Aerospace got some. Um, um, there's the uh, ACES engine, and there's the, uh, the refueling that they would be doing with that. Um, and eventually, uh, actually one of our favorites, Maston Aerospace, would be working with them to do the, uh, the lunar lander version of that. Uh, but for the International Space Station, um, in order to lead the handover of the International Space Station from NASA to the commercial sector, uh, they've awarded a lot of different study contracts to companies that are already involved. And something that I really like about this is not only is it going to be for existing stuff like the car, uh, commercial cargo vehicles, uh, but a lot of habitats and, and different studies on how to manage the space station. Uh, Axiom Space is one of the companies that uh, is, is uh, getting funding for this, Bigelow Aerospace, for their whole X-Space concept, which you see on screen there is getting money. Uh, Boeing and uh, Blue Origin are also getting money as well, and it's kind of unclear what uh, the study would be exactly for Blue Origin for it. But also, there is some really interesting stuff going on with Sierra Nevada. Oh my goodness, they have made a lot of progress on their proposal for the lunar orbiting platform, the first piece of that being the power and propulsion element. And oh my goodness, they have, have something that I like about this and the way that all these contracts work that I'm talking about is they're fixed price contracts. So the, NASA doesn't award any money to any of these companies until they see results. Sometimes it is just a, a study, a paper study needing to get data or, or wh whatever might be necessary. Some of it is demonstration missions and some of it's actual, you know, full blown missions. So now that Sierra Nevada has made progress with uh, the different pieces of their plan for the lunar orbiting platform, uh, they have received a little bit of money for, for that program, which is actually called the Next Step 2 program. Oh, man. But Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems has also gotten money for uh, continued operation of Cygnus. Um, Sierra Nevada also is getting money for their Dream Chaser cargo vehicle. And uh, there is a bit more as well for the um, Lockheed Martin and Boeing uh, habitats that could potentially be added to the International Space Station or would be for the lunar platform. This is a cutaway of Lockheed Martin's uh, habitat and could be flown on the first or second exploration mission of Orion. So uh, there's a bunch of different things that, that could be done here. And seeing NASA being serious about handing over the operations of the International Space Station to the, to the commercial sector gives me hope that we'll be able to extend its lifespan even further and get the full use out of it. In fact, there was a survey put out recently that said that we need to utilize the space station until at least 2028 just to finish the like uh, just just the NASA experiments that are on on the books right now and a lot of that is the different tech demos and stuff that we need in order to ensure that humans is a survive to the trip to Mars so that's why I'm excited about all of this stuff and I'm really happy to see NASA um, putting money into research and development and doing it under a fixed price system yes. and milestone based yeah. so you know you don't, don't don't you don't get any money for it unless we see results. Exactly. And that's why, I mean, first of all, I mean, thank you for telling us about all of those amazing things. It's kind of like Christmas in August, to be honest. <laughs> and um, no, you're absolutely right. The fact that they're basing this on actual deliverables, I mean, that's how progress gets made. At the end of the day, money speaks, you know? Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. partnership between um, government and commercial, like you said, I mean, it's it's the way to go. It's not, it's not either or, but it has to be, a, you know, a fusion of both. So I'm really excited to see, you know, some potential additions to the ISS, or at the very least, just using it to its full efficiency and making sure it lives out that lifespan. So we could see the culmination wow. of all these amazing experiments that, you know, so many people put so much effort into. So absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much. And I would much. really like to know. I'd really like to know what the community thinks. What's their favorite piece of space technology that's gotten uh, some research money recently? Yeah. What, what part of the deep space gateway do you think would? Uh, what are you rooting for? Boeing, Lockheed, Bigelow, Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. uh, let let us know what you think for sure.
Yeah, definitely. Let us know in the comments because, I mean, there's a lot of exciting stuff. You know, as we heard from Mike, there's a lot of exciting stuff getting funded and researched. So, you know, let us know what are you most excited about? What, you know, tickles you? Um, so, I guess, speaking of uh, tickling, uh, <laughs> Athena, uh, apparently we have some uh, ultra-hot Jupiters that are a little bit more like uh, stars than we previously might have thought. Yeah, so I'm not sure how that has to do with tickling. but yeah, no, <laughs> me neither, but go with it. Just go with it. Pretend like it made sense. Yeah, so I got super, super excited about this one because I have never heard about this before. It's uh, so super ultra-hot ultra, ultra hot Jupiters. Um, they're planets that are very similar to Jupiter in size, but I like to call them kind of a yin-yang planet because Ooh. their atmosphere is like split in half because half of it is um, very, very hot because they orbit really, really close to their star. And um, the other half is really, really, really cold. So they actually have like this, these crazy atmospheres and they say that it's more of like a, a star planet hybrid because mm -hmm. its atmosphere is a lot more like atmospheres that are found on stars, which is insane. I didn't really actually know about this. And it's because, um, the, the water molecules, so the hydrogen and oxygen, actually get torn apart from the, from the radiation of a mm -hmm. star close to it, um, that it actually causes it to have this completely different atmosphere. And it's around, they wrote this down, it's 2,000 to 3,000 degrees Celsius on one side. So on the day side, so the side that actually faces the star. Toasty. So here's like, um, this one is actually just a, um, an image, an artist rendition of, of what it looks like, but it's, it's just crazy because um, it is a planet, right? Um, but half of it, um, it has this crazy atmosphere, very similar to stars, but then that other side that's around 980 degrees Celsius, that's the side that is known as the night side faces away from um, the star itself. And its atmosphere is a lot more like planets. So what um, some theories are right now that, that scientists are believing is what causes this is that the winds coming from the day side are blowing literally these torn apart molecules into the night side and it allows for them to recombine and then form clouds. They condense and form clouds. So the hydrogen and oxygen molecules will recombine and, and condense to form clouds, creating more of that planet-like atmosphere. So it's super interesting. These are known as ultra-hot um, Jupiters. And this hits home for me because um, this is they're very similar. They're compared a lot of times to brown dwarfs. And brown dwarfs are known kind of as like failed stars um, because they no longer can sustain nuclear fusion and they're very, very cold. But um, but they do still get off, give off some form of heat. They do give off radiation. And you know, maybe you guys know about this, maybe you don't, but Trappist 1, who gets excited about Trappist 1? That is found around a low mass star, a brown dwarf star. And those planets are so similar to Earth and they orbit really close to, to the, um, the brown dwarf. So, I mean, this gets me excited because it's just so trippy when you think about it, that there's a planet that half of it is, is similar to what a star is like, half of it's similar to what a, what a planet's like. And to me, this just gives a whole new understanding to what, planets are out there that, that we might actually end up finding and discovering. I mean, especially, you know, to mention it again, James Webb, when that launches and then what TESS is doing right now, finding exoplanets, I think that this is a whole new classification out there. Um, like I said earlier, known as star planet hybrids. Um, so one thing that they're looking to research coming up soon is to actually try and probe the night side because it's been a bit difficult to try and gather some more research on that, but I really hope that we'll be able to do that in the future because my goodness, imagine living on a planet where like one side you actually can survive in the dark side because it has these clouds, it has a planet-like atmosphere, and then the other side it's like a star. Like, I just, I can't even. And that, and that fluctuation of temperature, 980 degrees Celsius to 3,000 degrees Celsius. So it's just nuts. I got really excited when I, when I read about this study. Um, that's literally what, what I'm excited about. And, and uh, yeah, I'm just wondering what, what you guys think. If you guys have heard about this, let me know. I've literally never heard of this before um, until, again, recently when I, when I read about this. Um, I knew about ultra-hot Jupiters, but um, as far as having this split atmosphere, that's just crazy. That's why I called it a yin-yang type of planet because mm -hmm. half of it is, is, yeah, like I said earlier, half of it's like a stellar atmosphere, half of it's like a planet atmosphere. So super exciting. I think it's going to bring a whole new understanding to what we think about planets out there and uh -huh. and maybe even how life might exist on these. Like, mm -hmm. you, you never know. I mean, especially with the like, extremophiles. Like, woof. So that's, that's how I feel about it. I, mean, I got I'm, really excited. Whew, I mean, I'm out of breath. It just, just goes to show, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this just goes to show the whole evolution of planets and under the right conditions, how they can evolve into stars and how stars under the right conditions can evolve into other different types of stars or eventually black holes. So 
Yeah. It's fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it just it takes the concept of the HR diagram and it just puts so much more dimension to it. Because and one thing I have to say, Athena, I just I love how you always bring it back to, well, there could be life or it could support life. Mm -hmm. We'll learn more about life that exists, yeah. out, you know, outside of our planet. So I just I have to give you props there that's because like, I, that's the root of astronomy. I think right? I mean, that's how I feel. It's it's always about trying to find what more is out there. I mean, every single research study I read, it's like okay, well, this is obviously tied to a better understanding of how we're here, why we're here, where we're going, and is there more out there? Because there mm -hmm. definitely is. It's just a matter of finding it and when we will. So, sorry, I know you're, you're no, no, saying no, no. I was, trust excited. Me, I was listening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Well, that's why I focus on the technology so, so that when yes. we do discover life out there, we have a way of getting there. And yes. there you go. We are all, you know, under one umbrella of a mission. And, yes. you know, you've got your technology, you've got your theory, and I've got the great dad jokes to bring us all <laughs> together so there's that. I love um, it. But thank you. I mean I think this goes along with your theme of your last story you know uh, dwarf galaxies oftentimes not too paid attention to by the general public but again you explained how interesting they really are and then you have hot Jupiters. I mean come on you're not really a star you're not a planet like you know what's going on with you and yet you brought the relevance to it so I mean thank you. I mean now I'll pay more attention when I see a headline having to do with a hot yes. Jupiter or a, a brown dwarf you know. Yes. Great. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so um, before we toss it to Jared, who is actually going to be interviewing Chuck Ryan of Shuttle Resolution, we want to give a huge shout out to our lovely Escape Velocity citizens. These awesome friends donate, or I'm sorry, contribute $10 per episode. Um, they help make the show happen. So thank you for supporting us. If you are interested in becoming an, a citizen of tomorrow, go ahead and head on over to Patreon slash TMRO. And don't forget the dot com, patreon.com slash TMRO. <laughs> thank you. Right. <laughs> And now we're going to go on a short little break. And when we return, we have Jared Head. And again, he is interviewing Chuck Ryan. Look into her face that turned my nation in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or fuck a little fashion lies. Fill on some expectation. This girl's a fascination. Well, hello again there. Um, so I know you've been waiting. We've got an exciting interview lined up with Jared on the observation deck. So I will go ahead and throw it to Jared. Jared, what do you got for us today? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, out on the news deck. We're now here on the observation lounge of Station 204. I'm Jared, and we're going to be talking to Chuck Ryan today. Chuck, welcome. Great. It was, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you, too. Good to be on the show. Yeah, and we're going to be talking a little bit today about sort of what we're, what we're calling the space shuttle you've never heard of. Um, but before we get into that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, because you have quite a colorful history with things. Uh, colorful, I guess you could use that term. <laughs> um, well, it all started on Halloween 64 when I was an orphan. I was born an orphan on the day of the uh, first astronaut fatality. Uh, Captain Theodore Freeman was flying his T-38 jet and uh, ran into a snow goose landing at Ellington Airfield outside of NASA in Houston. And uh, th that I didn't know that until later, obviously. But um, I like to mention him because uh, he's one of these astronauts. He was an astronaut candidate for Apollo, and uh, you know he gave the ultimate sacrifice. And very few people hear about him. And I like to make sure that everybody knows the sacrifices that have been made for the space program. Mm. And uh, yeah, I was running NASA at eight. I actually moved from California. At the, ends of, the end of the runway at Moffett Field Ames uh, to Michigan on, a, on July 16th, 1969, underneath Apollo 11 on its way to the moon. <laughs> Another just bizarre coincidence. Yeah. Um, and at eight, I was writing NASA, trying to volunteer, and uh, they, you know, I learned what it took to be an astronaut. So I got my advanced scuba certification at 13. I was flying airplanes over my house at uh, 15 without my parents knowing it. <laughs> Uh, that's, we, a, that's a heck of a thing to be doing yeah, without your parents knowing about it. We were at it. the end of the runway, too. Uh -huh. So, you know, hi. You know. Uh, I suspected my dad you know, kind of knew. But, uh, uh, but then at 18, I, had, I sent a duty felt letter to NASA. And uh, they, by the time I arrived in California with a decrepit British sports car, 
uh, they said, yeah, we, you want to volunteer? Sure. You know, because constant hiring freezes and budget cuts and so forth. Um, so I've worked on eight different programs at three NASA centers at this point. I mm -hmm. got to work on the Quiet Short Haul Research Aircraft. That was my first one as a volunteer. Then I was picked up as a civil servant with the, and got to fly on the uh, Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which Ooh. is a modified C-141 uh, SP with a uh, one-meter infrared telescope in it. That's awesome. And, yeah. you know, they gave you, gave, you know, I'm like 20, they gave me flight suits and jackets. I have my NASA nameplate. I'm flying on this aircraft exploring space. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, as one does, yeah, you know, in yeah. their early 20s. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also worked with, uh, in the beginning, with uh, the SOFIA program, which is the Stratospheric Observatory for mm -hmm. Infrared Astronomy. It's yeah. a 747 with a 10-foot diameter yeah. telescope. Bigger. <laughs> um, and uh, then the big wind tunnel at Ames. Okay. I got accepted to Cal Poly to study uh, astronautical engineering. Uh, my branch chief or group leader went there, so I said, you know, go there. And uh, uh, during the summers, I would work at in Houston, and I got to work with the uh, Lunar Mars Exploration Office, Planet Surface Systems, um, Space Station Program Office, and the uh, Mission Operations Directorate, uh, and uh, that was wonderful. You know, that was uh, uh, really I got to support a couple shuttle launches. Um, I got to meet Gene Kranz, who is just a fantastic symbol of the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I created, then the trouble started. <laughs> uh, I created, I was very gung-ho and saw the challenges facing NASA, and I wanted to do something about it. So I created this uh, university-based organization called SPAN, Support and Promotion for the Activities of NASA. And the idea is we would do outreach, education, and small engineering projects. Uh, well, we did all that, but then the the phrase that should never be uttered was, and that is, how hard can it be? <laughs> it's just a structure. You know, a shuttle is just a structure, really, when you boil it down. Yeah. And we're, we're engineers, kind of. It's you just, know, we're just, students. It's just you sheets know. of stuff, just, right? Just structure. Yeah. You know, no problem, right? Problem. So, uh, so we started to build this, sh this shuttle mock-up, and, uh, and the school... Didn't, wasn't exactly happy with it, you know, they weren't making money, and, you know, there's a two-story structure materializing at the hangar, there's news up there all the time, <laughs> so they politely asked me to move it off campus, um, and it wound up in Santa Maria on a, a migrant strawberry farm, uh, and at a certain point, I, I realized to, it took a level of commitment that was just going to be everything, you know. Um, so I, uh, I had a support building I moved into and just started working on it. And, and I got a call from the fire rescue department at the Kennedy Space Center. And they said, we've, we've learned about this. We've needed one for a long time. Chuck, your country needs you. NASA needs you. And that's a quote. Now, talking about telling the, wrong per the right person the wrong phrase or the wrong person the right phrase, there, that, that was it for me. That was the swashbuckling mission that I really wanted. Like, it's on now. It's Here on. Here we go. In fact, the name of, it, uh, the, of my mock-up was the resolution. But when they asked for it, I added the exclamation mark to the end of the name. And that was it. It was, <laughs> uh, it, it was on. So uh, uh, construction continued. Uh, most of the original structure had been destroyed. So it was almost like bot building a new uh, shuttle. And mm -hmm. uh, this is what NASA calls a uh, shuttle crew compartment trainer. So it's from the nose to the cargo bay. Mm -hmm. In fact, they wanted a little bit of cargo bay, too. Um, and you could rotate it into launch configuration uh, to practice rescuing the astronauts on the pad mm -hmm. or, you know, a post-landing. Yeah. You could use it for the suit techs, the uh, closeout crew, the guys that strap them into their seats. Um, there was just the one little, there, there were a couple problems. Uh, first of all, it, NASA has these in Houston, these crew compartment trainers. It takes dozens of people, uh, uh, two years and one to two million tax dollars to build one. Uh, I was alone with no money and on the wrong side of the continent. So if you can imagine the, the front of a 747, and you have to get it from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, that, that's not so bad, except mm -hmm. that every rail guy from coast to coast said no. It's impossible. If you even attempt to send it, we'll turn it back at the Mississippi. <laughs> so I sent it anyway. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Three months later, uh, it had to go as a high wide. They had to you know, stop rail traffic through the United States. And I'm plotting it each day as I work on the seats and switches in Utah. And when it got to the Mississippi, that was the, you know, the, the, the nail-biting experience. Yeah, this is the moment. It so. sailed over, and uh, it, 
uh, not only got to NASA, NASA lost it at one point, I will say. It, <laughs> they got hooked up to the wrong train and taken back up to Jacksonville. <laughs> and So I get to Florida. It arrived at Kennedy the day after return to flight. I think it was STS-114. And uh, as one shuttle launched, another one entered. They both kind of looked at each other, I like to think. <laughs> And uh, what they did is they hooked it, uh, the resolution on its, in three building sized pieces on this 89 foot rail car. They hooked it up to uh, solid rocket booster segments coming from Utah. So, you know, it even had, uh, and they not only took it into NASA, but there's a, what's called the controlled access area around the, um, uh, ve the, the vehicle assembly building and the orbiter processing facilities, the, the hangars, and it went right through there hooked up to SRBs, and then they separated it, so shuttle SRB SEP was actually on a train. Gotcha. Of. Okay. Uh, and it became the only other shuttle to be amongst the fleet at Kennedy. Wow. So you, so uh, this, this handcrafted shuttle, your handcrafted shuttle, uh, was at Kennedy Space Center yes, for sir. a time. So. Yes. Uh, and the, the understanding was um, that it'd be taken off to be finished. Uh, so I had to have a police escort through NASA, and that was quite a quite a little spectacle, uh, uh, and then we got it reassembled, and uh, it was being worked on, um, and uh, uh, see, I was cold most of the time in Florida, it's like this <laughs> windswept uh, um, tumbleweeds and so forth, mm -hmm. I was buzzing the farmers in a plane with uh, Bart Simpson on the tail, I, I told you, <laughs> uh, but Florida was a different animal altogether, and by animal I mean alligator, uh, but there, were, there was a lake adjacent to where the shuttle was, and it was off grid, so I had to be use p solar power uh, to power the tools and lights and so forth. And I was incorporating it into the shuttle to be solar powered also. Um, and yeah, it was 100 degrees and 100% humidity every day. And, it, and the lake was beautiful, but it, it wasn't even refreshing. It was hot. And the first night there, I saw the what looked like contrails on the surface of the water in the sunset from all the alligators swimming in it. And I'm like, well, I can't swim in that. But as time goes on, it, you realize, hey, I'm top of the food chain on this planet. Uh, so I, little by little, started, you know, until, until finally I'm just swimming. I don't care. I, I did have a dive knife and a mm -hmm. uh, scuba fins and a mask to give me a fighting chance. And, and the alligator would literally come over when I, when I did this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why that was. I still don't <laughs> understand that. Uh, but then... Um, uh, we, uh, I was in it during uh, uh, Hurricane Wilma, but then oh. Tropical Storm Faye sailed toward us like a warship and anchored over NASA for four days and four nights. That lake next to the shuttle just grew until the shuttle was in the lake. In the flashes of lightning at night, waves were crashing over the nose of the resolution in a <sighs> maritime-like tragedy. Uh, but that wasn't the cannonball that sunk the ship. Um, as we are all aware, um, every four to eight years, a new president comes into office and basically cancels whatever manned spaceflight uh, program was going on. And uh, that's what happened here. The uh, uh, Constellation program was canceled, and the uh, shuttle was prematurely re retired. And it was very frustrating to be right at the finish line, um, uh, w you know, with the amount of effort and uh, uh, hundreds of companies had uh, uh, pitched in coast to coast. Uh, donating material equipment and services for the resolution. Um, and uh, this is what I would like the, the um, legacy of the resolution to be, is that I'm not alone in this. Uh, maybe a dramatic example, but I'm not alone. I stand side by side with my NASA brothers and sisters in this. Uh, tens of thousands of engineers, scientists, and support personnel and contractors spend decades with tens of billions of tax dollars ultimately to have their uh, program canceled by uh, a politician. And uh, I think NASA has been used as a political football f long enough, you know, for 50 years, uh, to list some of the programs that were canceled, uh, Apollo 18, Apollo 19, Apollo 20, Assured Crew Return Vehicle, not to mention a shuttle launch complex at Vandenberg, but that's Air Force side. Uh, Lunar Mars Initiative, Constellation. Uh, how long is this madness going to continue? Yeah. And uh, I feel it's time to get NASA in the hands of a, deca a decadal survey, uh, a panel of scientists and engineers that come together every 10 years. Uh, there is a precedent for this at JPL. This is how they handle mm -hmm. the, un uh, the, you know, the unmanned missions. Mm -hmm. And it works fine. Um, 
And I'd, I'd like to see that happen because, uh, as you know, we have the STEM program in the United States. Um, and that is a way to artificially motivate uh, people to go into science and math. And uh, I'm what they call a child of Apollo, uh, you know, growing up during the moon mission or, or being born during all of that. And uh, you didn't have to artificially motivate us, you know, <laughs> we were on it, you know. Yes. Um, so, and it was our generation that the Apollo generation passed the torch to. And that's one reason I created SPAN, that's why I did the resolution, and that's why I'm here today, is to, to carry that torch on. And what do you think it's going to take in order to carry the, uh, that torch, or to pass that torch on to, to future generations? Well, like I said, I, it, getting NASA in the hands of a decadal survey is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Because then we wouldn't have this every four to eight years, uh, having it canceled and starting almost from scratch. You know, that's, that's no way to get things done, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we need a consistent effort. Uh, I, I was uh, thrilled during the Apollo Soyuz test project and uh, doing things with the Russians. And I, it does need to be an international effort to go to Mars. Uh, space, is, space is laid out like a lesson plan, I always thought. You know, first there's uh, suborbital, sub orbital, the moon, Mars, you know, it's, it's a nice lesson plan, you know. And I don't think we should jump steps. I think uh, when I worked with the Lunar Mars office, um, we talked about the uh, in situ resource utilization that we're going to use. And the idea is, is you land, uh, you have a little uh, uh, process, a plant, so to speak, uh, not a plant, but like an industrial plant um, that will uh, harvest oxygen and hydrogen out of the regolith or you mm -hmm. know, the, the Martian soil. And uh, you, that way, with hydrogen and oxygen, you have everything. You have air to breathe, you have water, you have rocket fuel and oxidizer. Um, but that's, you know, that takes some skill, you know, and it takes practice. And that's, the moon is three days away. So uh, it's, it's a safer way to go about it. Mars is much farther. It's a much uh, higher level of difficulty that we shouldn't just jump into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you think um, that in, in trying to kind of figure out where we should go to something like uh, the recently revived National Space Council, does it kind of fit in with that? Or, well, or is it a little different from kind of what you're thinking about to help out? No. Um, the National Space Council is made up of uh, a lot of Defense Department individuals, people from Transportation Office, uh, and uh, I, I don't see how that's helpful. That's not my call, of course, um, but that's not... I, I wouldn't have made that decision, and mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessary. Yeah, and I was, I was just seeing there's a, you know, they've got the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and a lot of people in right, sort of right. the, in, the interior of the U.S. government um, working I, on that. I, I'm adamant that uh, I'm Trek, not wars, you mm -hmm. know? I want NASA to be exploration and discovery and not defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty cool. So, do you still work for NASA, by the uh, way? Because one of our uh, one of our viewers, uh, uh, Stormer, on the our chat room is asking if you still work for NASA. Uh, not currently. I'm. Uh, I was actually on my way back to school. Uh, I was in school and decided to change schools. Uh, I wanted to go back to the Midwest, and uh, uh, I thought, well, I'll go through Los Angeles, and uh, I have the uh, book about the resolution that I, I wrote on a Lakota reservation in South Dakota, uh, which was very interesting. And um, I, I wasn't going to write the screenplay, but it just kind of happened. It mm -hmm. was kind of therapeutic, maybe. Um, and I thought, well, I'll go to L.A. and, you know, pitch that for a little bit. So I'm here doing that before going back to school. Gotcha. So, you're, so you are kind of going from NASA to movies with it there. I guess that's uh, a, a way to say it. Ju just this one. Just this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're just going to give it a shot and see what happens. Right. So. Right. I, I mean, it's it's really a no-brainer, <laughs> I, I think. And and there hasn't been a NASA movie for the last 48 years of our history. Uh, Apollo 13 was about 1970. Hidden Figures was about 1960. Uh, the new one about Armstrong is about 1969. So, and more people have given their lives during uh, the shuttle era than the Apollo uh, mm -hmm. generation even. So it's really time for us to have a movie, a NASA movie for our generation. Mm -hmm. So something a little more in line with what, uh, what people may be a little more familiar with. Uh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, we've been living off Apollo heritage. It sh certainly shouldn't be forgotten. I, I, mm -hmm. and sh it should be uh, uh, celebrated. But also, you know, there's a whole generation of shuttle flights that uh, 
uh, you know, is a legacy also. Yeah. And, and that's what's great about this story is that you see what happens uh, at NASA in the background. Mm -hmm. And it actually parallels what had happened to the resolution. So, so with um, with the idea of like making uh, like a shuttle era movie, what do you think would be like sort of the the best spot to do that in? What what would be like what would be that mission that you'd really want to focus on? Well, that's why my oddball story is great for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I move through Ames and J Johnson Space Center and the uh, Kennedy Space Center, and you see what's going on at NASA. In fact, I was, you know, I volunteered at NASA at 18, uh, partly because there were so many budget cuts and hiring freezes. Uh, I was there during the Challenger accident. Uh, I had my the resolution uh, getting ready to leave to, for Florida during the Columbia accident. I, I was actually uh, had the privilege of uh, getting on board Columbia. Uh, getting dimensions for the resolution at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, my cohort, uh, Casey Caton Chipwadia, uh, who was uh, uh, in SPAN, and um, we became brothers through the whole thing. Uh, he um, was subsystems manager for crew escape hardware uh, at the Johnson Space Center. And he uh, was on the investigation for Columbia. In fact, took off from grad school to do that. Uh, just w uh, one of the finest individuals I've ever had the privilege of meeting. And that's one of the things that happened uh, after the cancellation of Constellation and the retirement, premature retirement of uh, shuttle, is people left NASA in waves, and it was just heartbreaking, you know, and, and uh, certainly not what we want. Was it like a true brain drain at the at the end of that program for NASA? Is that kind of how it went? No, it was uh, ha having everything canceled after, you know, continuously after so much effort is. People got fed up, and uh, and you know the United States is grounded right now, um, and that's sad, and that's certainly not a situation that you want. And it's almost like we don't have astronauts. We uh, pay the uh, Russian space program to take our astronauts up, so really they're American cosmonauts at this point, mm -hmm. and that's uh, you know for what's supposed to be the greatest country in the world, that's just not uh, that's not what it's not what you want. Mm -hmm. We do have a question from our. Twitch chat room from Hades Vorwerp, which is, uh, what do you think about all the new rocket companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and others? Do you think that uh, that's sort of something that's going to help out with that? Uh, Elon is hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's wonderful. Uh, of course, uh, NASA goes outward and explores and discovers, and then commercial space comes in behind that. Uh, that's a logical sequence, and then even tourists and uh, commercial ventures. Uh, so I do think that um, SpaceX is going to be a, a player in it, for sure. Um, and we didn't have that. Uh, when they canceled the uh, Lunar Mars Initiative back in the late 80s, uh, we didn't have Elon and SpaceX. So this is going to really help us. It gives us more of a chance of actually making it happen. So mm -hmm. uh, that's wonderful. Blue Horizons and um, um, things like uh, Virgin, Virgin Galactic, uh, that's going to be great to raise awareness when, the, you know, tourists finally get to go into suborbital flights. Uh, but sure, this is certainly going to help. Yeah. And uh, kind of to just to go back a little bit and talk a little bit more about uh, shuttle resolu uh, resolution that you, you built. Um, what ended up happening with resolution? Because you talk about uh, taking it to Kennedy Space Center, but what, did, what, did, what actually truly happened to resolution? Well, um, the tropical storm Faye uh, mm -hmm. damaged it. Uh, there were there was water damage, and the, the planks of the scaff it's surrounded by scaffolding if you can imagine, um, and the planks were being blown off uh, during the uh, high winds and uh, waves crashing over it. It was uh, it was just awful. And uh, while it was being repaired, the, the shuttle program was basically ended, and uh, uh, NASA came out did a survey, and it was really there wasn't a need at that point. Uh, so uh, we looked around for a, um, an outfit to take possession of it to, so it would get good use. And there was a uh, camp, like a space camp kind of thing that was materializing in Florida, and they had taken possession of it. Unfortunately, that fell through, and um, uh, it, the resolution became basically a shipwreck. And uh, I, I'm reminded of the uh, story of uh, Ernest Shackleton and his ship, the Endeavor, uh, the uh, Endurance. Mm -hmm. At the South Pole. At the South yeah. Pole. It was crushed to splinters in the ice there. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
not the the tragedy of the ship that is remembered. It's the perseverance of the captain and crew and the, the story of that. Um, it, the resolution started out as a shuttle trainer, but it became much more than that. Uh, it had 3,000 miles on it at the end. I mean, it was really kind of a ship of discovery for me, you know. Yeah, and, and, the and the funny thing about it was, too, and I took pictures along the way, it had been moved a dozen times. And, uh, you know, because housing developments come in and you have to move it again. And mm -hmm. moving a two-story building, not, not, not yeah, fun at all. Not easy. Um, but I would take pictures out the main hatch. And it had seen so many different landscapes from coast to coast. It w had gone through the shuttle launch complex at Vandenberg along the Pacific. It went through Los Angeles and through Haw uh, Houston, uh, uh, through the uh, Kennedy Space Center, became part of the, you know, uh, uh, briefly uh, the only other shuttle to be part of the fleet. So it really had a, a journey, and it has kind of an impressive logbook, I think. Yeah, and people would, would pe people would see it as it was being transported, right? Yeah, I would. Yes, of course. I'd, a lot of people didn't know what it was, and we were going to put like <laughs> shuttle stickers and stuff on it. But the idea was, you know, we were trying to keep a low profile with the railroads, mm -hmm. seeing that they didn't want it to go. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um, but the, the, when we loaded it, and even when it was shrink wrapped, there were people running out there with cameras, you mm -hmm. know, because the flight deck, and it was vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, each of these segments were vertical, and. Um, it's a really a different feeling, even in a shuttle trainer, to be in a vertical configuration. Oh, it yeah. has a, a, this feeling of earnestness, like we're going to be underway. You yeah, know? you're on the stack. We're yeah. ready to go. Yeah. It's, right. it's, it's time to light it, and we're going to get to T-Zero as soon as we can and make it happen. Exactly. So. And, uh, yeah, I had the privilege of seeing uh, 13 shuttle launches uh, while I was in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I would park in the, vehicle, uh, the, the launch control center parking lot, which is basically as close as you can be. And it was fantastic to be able to see that. Of course, I was green with envy the whole time <laughs> during every flight. But yeah. So, what was your favorite thing about uh, about about shuttle resolution? Was it was it coming up with it? Was it building it? Was it moving it? Was it, it was. I I, I, don't, I can't speak for everybody else, but I wanted a swashbuckling mission, uh, a special way to serve. You know, and I had grown up with uh, tales of the military. You know. I don't know if you've ever seen MASH, mm -hmm. you know, and you see these people and they were uh, doctors, medics, and so they're doing something good in a bad situation, you mm -hmm. know, and they were suffering and, and my father was in the Navy and it was always my intention to serve. Um, and this was my way to serve. This was uh, my unique thing to do for NASA and uh, the, the shuttle resolution story isn't over. Uh, this is the finale of it, me being in Hollywood trying to get this movie made, because it could really have an impact, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's fun and, you know, and serious and fatalistic and it has all the <laughs> elements that everybody wants, so. Yeah, and um, in kind of thinking about that, that ability to give service um, and with that, we've got a really good question from our own uh, Minnie Stoge here in the studio, which is asking, what advice would you give to citizens who want to help with NASA programs? Like, what's, what's the best thing that those of us who aren't involved in NASA can actually do that makes a meaningful impact with NASA? Well, uh, there used to be letter writing campaigns. Uh, but I, I th and that's always helpful, talking to your uh, representative and Congress uh, personnel. Um, and uh, I, I think we really have to see what the problem is and uh, see that it's being used as a political football and really to get on board with this idea of, uh, of getting NASA into the hands of a decadal survey. And uh, I, uh, I, I think that's, that's really a, a great way to, to go about it. And, uh, just by going to the NASA website a lot, the, the NASA Twitter pages, the more, the more you're looking at NASA and the more uh, support they have, the, the harder it is for the, uh, the politicians to say no to their programs. Mm -hmm. And Chuck, uh, for folks who'd like to get more info about you and, and the story of Shuttle Resolution, um, how can they do that? Uh, there's a shuttleresolution.com. No, no exclamation mark in that one. <laughs> um, it's also, uh, there's Chuck Ryan on Twitter. Uh, there's also Chuck Ryan uh, uh, Facebook and a Resolution uh, 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 Facebook page. 
So multiple places you can go to find yeah, out Yes, about and it. I'm, I'm doing a, it's in work right now, a, a YouTube series called From NASA to Florida, or From NASA to Hollywood, sorry. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is, have you ever thought about leaving your life and <laughs> going to Hollywood and try to have a movie made? Well, it's kind of like that, except that we're coming from NASA, kind of. Uh, and like my car was stolen with all my luggage in it at one point oh. uh, since I've been here, so get to update my wardrobe. So, yeah, so that's, that's uh, I up, suppose, one way to do it. it. And so. I did get the car back, but... Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, look for that uh, from NASA to Hollywood, and that should be entertaining at the very least. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show today, Chuck. Well, uh, thank we, you for having we me. really appreciate you coming on and talking to us about Space Shuttle Resolution, and now our viewers know about a space shuttle that, uh, that they might not have known about uh, that actually does exist. So yeah, does thank, exist. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much for <laughs> thank that. Thank you. So before we go to our break, we want to thank our citizens of tomorrow, especially of the Escape Velocity variety. These folks give us $10 or or more per episode. But of course, we also have our orbital citizens as well. These folks give us $5 or more per episode, and you get a lot of goodies no matter what level you're at. So if you'd like to help contribute to our show, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And now we are going to take a break. So there's more tomorrow coming up right after this. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, Let's explore the science of tomorrow. Well, hello again, tomorrow. Welcome back. Um, so we are actually going to start delving into the comments from last week's show. And uh, in case you were there, maybe you weren't, we actually got to interview Peter Beck of Rocket Lab, a really, really fascinating <sighs> interview. You guys so seemed to love okay. it. I know Jared did for sure. So good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just go ahead and dive right into what you had to say. Um, the first comment is actually from Marnix Jansen on YouTube. Uh, they stated, though I think Mike did a good job, I have to say that boy, did I hate those launch minutes. Mm. Way too much text, couldn't follow it all, no time for questions from the others. It was a bad plan, perfectly executed. What? Aww. It was Aww. a bad plan, but it was perfectly executed. So. <laughs> Okay, so pretty much, yes, Facebook did a good job. We like things a little bit differently today. Um, exactly. We decided that we still want to have mm. things be, you know, quick and concise for, for the launch minute because that's just a, a nice, a really nice thing that we like. But then afterwards, we'll have a little bit of wrap up where we can talk a little bit more about it, talk about how we feel about the launch was, what our favorite part of it was, mm. answer any questions that might be in the chat room, and just talk, you know, amongst ourselves um, about it. So. Um, in the future, we're going to try this out where um, we'll do the launch minute and then kind of have a little uh, wrap up afterwards to, to talk about each one in a, maybe a little bit more depth if there's even something to talk about. Sometimes like with a Chinese launch, you know, we might only have that bit to say for, for the launch minute and not really have much to say about it afterwards. So it really depends yeah. on what launch it is, what type it is, all that sort of thing. But uh, so I hope that you guys liked what we what we did today, where we uh, discussed uh, the launch afterwards a little bit. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's like the philosophy of tomorrow is constantly improving. I mean, the idea of launch minutes is actually pretty ambitious when you think about it. Like that's so much information yeah. to try to condense into a minute um, and then not completely stumble over every other word. So, I mean, personally, I think you did great the first time. And again, you know, thank you for the feedback. We always take it into account. And you and your comments is what helps us make a better show. Mm -hmm. So um, moving right on, the next comment is from Francisco Pinto, also via YouTube. Francisco stated, Mike, what a good job. Assuming it was not previously recorded, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the interview with Peter was probably the best I've seen in 2018. And I've seen them all. Jared is doing such a good job. Thanks. The show is getting very <laughs> professional. Impressive. I just hope you have more views to produce the audience you need. Yeah. If we could just roll oh. it all in, you know, that'd be pretty great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, of course, that's yeah. why we have, you know, Patreon and we're able to do all these amazing fancy things, you know, yes. with support from viewers like you. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I think that they actually bring out a good point, Jared. Your, yeah. your interview skills it was are really just good. on yeah. fire. Well, I mean, like, the nice thing <laughs> is that everyone we bring on the interview is, like, really fun to interview and really great to interview. It's not, True. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just And the comments perfect. feed it so uh -huh. well. Exactly. The comments in the chat, you guys come up with really good questions. So even yeah. if, like, where there wasn't too much plans, which there usually is, which is nice, there's always great material here. It's, so. it's like it the perfect all me. storm all the time. It's yeah. not all me. I mean, it's... it's it's uh, mostly you, but it's kind of everything. No, I'm, I'm just it, kidding. It, I know, it's a very small part, but it's also the guest that comes on, uh, the, yes. the, the stuff that we get from the guest, the preparation, yeah. you as the viewers adding you to the conversation. Like the viewers They're like the you. Thing. We're the cupcake. Okay, cupcake. Yeah, that makes sense. So it all comes Ooh. together. And then Are those like stuffed cupcakes? Tremendous amount of glitter thrown on top of it. The so. edible kind, though, because yes. I believe the inedible would Nothing leave you with some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know I will, though. You know I will. Okay, mm -hmm. moving Thanks. on. This is also yeah, from YouTube. Uh, this is from Ann On. Uh, Hayabusa 2, can you interview Elizabeth Tasker, the Brit astrophysicist who was working on JAXA's Hayabusa 2 mission, which cool? launched in 2014, and right now it's hovering over a tiny 900-meter asteroid 100 million miles oh. away? It has four teeny tiny robot rovers and cameras to map the entire thing out. And it'll bring samples back to Earth in 2020. All for $150 million. Gambat, yo! <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Guns blazing. So, yeah. I gotta say, that, that would be great. I mean, the Hi yes. Hayabusa yeah, 2 has been a on. really cool mission. So, yeah. Wow, absolutely. It's sick. Yeah, and so actually, get them on then, absolutely. Yeah, and then I think, you know, when Mike was mentioning all of the. Um, projects and missions that NASA is now funding and mm -hmm. putting some more time into. Somebody actually mentioned the Hayabusa missions um, and stating, you know, kind of all of the really, really neat things to come out of that. So, I mean, Elizabeth, if you're out there, we have a seat warmed up just for you. <laughs> Jared's sitting on it. <laughs> Jared's sitting yes. On it. Yes, right. I am. Oh, and, um, and I just want to say, uh, to kind of build on this comment that we got from it, if you viewers know someone who mm -hmm. you think would be a really great guest to have on the show, you should get in touch with us. And you should hook us up with them. Yeah. So, yep. Just saying. Give I us mean, a warm like, introduction, man. I mean, or maybe it's you. At yeah. this point, we're just <laughs> reaching funny. in the dark and, you know, just give us some, yeah. just slide us some intros. That would be pretty great. You know, we're here. Help us help you. Yes. All right. And then last <laughs> but not least, this comment is from Johnny Spacer. He's an Escape Velocity citizen, and this comes straight from the Tomorrow community. Mm -hmm. uh, Johnny states, I was late to the party, but not too late to hear Peter's preference for robots in space over humans. I found this interesting mm. to say the least, and a bit taken aback. All in all, he's right. We humans are extremely fragile and high maintenance. Because of this, I think we need to utilize robotics, AI, and telepresence to the max. I'm not saying no to humans. I'm just saying let our tools, AKA our robots, robotics, AI, and telepresence, build our habitats before our arrival. That way we can have a relatively safe place in space um, from which we can survive and thrive, and then expand further out into our destiny. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. I like that. I love that like all of that was written in there because all of that was so relevant. Yes. Because I feel like so many times when we ask that question, robotic or human, there's a lot of opinions of, of human because we're all so eager, obviously, to, to go and to get space. But I think that that formula, formula of a plan to get the robots there, have them build first, and then we join, Mm -hmm. um, I definitely v vote for that. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah. So yeah, when when he said that, I'm glad that it. Yeah. It, Johnny and I, Spacer had repeated that. It was and really I kind good. of and I thought that was pretty interesting as well because I mean, echoing that sentiment, um, I mean, it's I, I appreciate the ambition and kind of the the big dream of one day humans in you know actual elongated space travel. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I mean, you know, Johnny Spacer said it quite eloquently here. We're pretty darn fragile and yeah. we're pretty darn yeah. high maintenance. I mean, I know yeah. we bring up tardigrades a lot on this show, which I'm not <laughs> yeah. complaining about, but look at those guys. Look at how tough they are. They yes. don't need fancy spacesuits that cost stupid amounts of money. And yeah. um, so, you know, why not send 
our you know robots out first, let them deal with the brunt of it, and then kind of fix it up for us a little bit. You know, <laughs> send tardigrades yeah, just, first, and then we go. <laughs> I mean, let the robots handle it. So they, that's what they they're there it. for. Yeah. Robots don't complain when they run out of air. They don't. They don't. You know, put in. They don't give you a one-star review when you. Fly they're not them, yelpers. When they when you fly them they through ten thousand rads. There's no, there's no interpersonal <laughs> issues, so, so there's no drama. Yeah. Robots are chill, yeah. man. Robots are just like really good people. <laughs> I can't wait. I cannot wait until the very far future when we become the robots. Okay. And, and well, we're now we're getting back onto this okay, hologram. I was going to say, <laughs> I, I mean, you kind of already are, I guess, right now. I agree with that so much, and it's simply because of my sinuses. So that's Aww. that's why I'm so excited about Aww. that future, is because if it can get rid of sinuses, yes. You see, all major innovations uh, stem from some sort of just. You know, discomfort ne in the human discomfort race. Discomfort Necessity in is the mother of invention, yeah. I think, right? That's right. That's how it goes. Oh, it sounds like a lot of syllables. Of Curiosity. I don't know. Well, stepfather. So. Okay. Marketing. Anyways. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that concludes comments from last week. Um, be sure to drop your comments below so that we can address them next week. Um, and before we actually head out, we want to give a humongous thank you to our citizens, especially <laughs> of the escape velocity, <laughs> orbital, and suborbital flight. Flavors. Um, Escape Velocity citizens contribute $10 an episode, Orbital contributes $5 an episode, Suborbital $2.50 an episode, and of course our ground support citizens $1 to $2.50 an episode. Um, and again, as uh, Jared had mentioned, as we like to mention throughout the show, you guys are what makes this show happen. So thank you from the bottom of our little hearts for supporting yeah. us. And if you would like to join the family, please head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. As always, do Sorry. not forget to subscribe and ring that cute little bell that's Which, in one it, of these is corners. Here? Is it up well, there? Well, go where ahead and it? click on it um, because okay. we're, of course, awesome and we love you. Um, so uh, with that being said, make sure you tune in next week um, because we are actually going to have Emery Stagmer, uh, yes. a.k.a. Max, uh, on the show. Um, and amongst many things, he's the lead satellite flight software engineer for NASA's lacrosse satellite. Um, but I'm sure the, we will delve into a whole bunch of oh, yes. neat things about Anytime that back. individual. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anytime Vax, time yeah, anytime he comes on here, it's just literally like, hey, Vax, what do you want to talk about? And he just goes it's for like, it. Yes. So, this because is, uh, if anybody knows it, Vax does. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, so uh, we'll keep the seats warm, and we will see you next Saturday at 21 UTC. That's right. Wait, no, 1800 UTC. 1800 UTC. Like, well, we also do have a science episode science. next week. And we also have a science episode next week. Episode next week. So, yeah, there you Which go. Which starts at... So. 2100 UTC. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.